I always said I would not have a Citroen Zaro Picasso car. They were the one of the most boring cars I thought ever. And then one day I needed lots of space in the car and suddenly the Picasso became my car of choice. I bought one and it was one of the most reliable cars I've ever had. It had tons of room, it was very practical, it was economic, I could take loads of camera kit in it and basically I had to eat my words. Now the camera I'm going to talk today I compare a little bit to the Picasso because from the outset it's not the most exciting camera however it's incredibly practical and it does everything you want it to. The camera I'm going to talk to you today about is the Canon EOS 300. This came out in about the year 2000-2001 and was part of the EOS range. Um, they varied in number, there was a 1000 which was a moderately cheap one, the EOS 1 was the top one, this was sort of a little bit in the middle. Um, it came after a long line of development in SLR cameras. If you really think about it, the SLR began to take off in 1960s and then with the Nikon and with the Canon it really developed into the 70s. By the 80s you were getting automatic type of shutter speeds and aperture priorities. By the time you get to the 90s you're getting all sorts of interesting cameras with all these automatic things on them but various designs. By the year 2000 most of the manufacturers, in particular Canon and Nikon, have come up and Pentax have come up with a very similar camera and the EOS 300 is light rate it is quite a plastic based camera, however it is great to use. The main dead easy to load a film, you basically undo the back here and put the film. Do be incredibly careful with this shutter here, it hates fingers. Um, I used to use these a lot with A-level students and I don't know why but the A-level students seem to really like putting their fingers in the shutters. Um, avoid it, the camera doesn't like it. So you simply put the film in over there, the leader just into there and close the back. One of the great design features of this camera is that as soon as you put the film in it will wind it all the way out of the cassette onto the spool and then it basically every shot you take the spool rhymes back. So when you get to the end of the film and take your last shot, unlike other cameras which have to rhyme all the film back, you've only got a little bit to rhyme back, which means if something goes wrong with your film, and which is unlikely but it could do, and the back is open, the photographs you have already taken are in the cassette. I think that is a great part of design there. These EOS cameras came after the T-series. They had this new Canon mount here which meant that the lenses were a, basically a new lens mount but you had all the automatic functions on. To turn the camera on you've got a red for lock, green I used to say was for idiot, I'm sure it's not but green is, a, um, is the automatic function, you just put it on green and you can just um, point and shoot and there we are. I think they used to call the next lot a creative phrase. You had a portrait and in the portrait setting it will automatically set a nice large aperture like 4.5 or smaller if you've um, to get a good a shallow depth of field. In landscape mode it will try to cause a large depth of field so the aperture will be more like f11 
um, we have a flower to enable you to do close-ups sports will the camera will automatically go on the um, fast speed and we have a nighttime mode plus we got program I can never quite work out the difference between program and green but program the flash doesn't automatically pop up TV is for time or shutter speed AV for aperture value you basically set your aperture and the camera automatically sets a shutter speed for you M you can set your shutter speed and simply by pressing the back here you can then to turn your by pressing that there you can then change the aperture um, you have a button for what focus segment you are going for zoom here manual focus just on the side here and there we have it what could be more straightforward a slight problem with buying one now you occasionally find that it's rather you can because of the material they used on the plastic you can pick them up and they're not very nice because they can feel sticky that is not a problem if you get some form of ethanol cleaner that will take off a very fine surface and leave the camera nice and clean the biggest problem with buying these is either they work brilliantly or i'm afraid they don't work when you switch them on you need to test them with a battery and from my memory they take yes they take two CR2 batteries which aren't too expensive they take two of those but when you turn the camera on you still get the nice display and you still get a full battery if you get a not a full battery and it's flashing that could mean a flat battery and that is what most people assume a flashing battery sign means but unfortunately in the case of Canon cameras cameras it means there's an error and it normally means um, the shutter is gone um, so there we have it uh, Canon EOS at one point when these were incredibly cheap compared to other film cameras if you get a working one they are beginning to creep up um, I would say anything from 20 to 50 to 60 pounds you might get one a lot cheaper um, what I find fascinating about this camera is that if you think about it the camera which really came after this was the D300 which of course is a digital camera and but it followed very much the model of this and to one sense and purpose this is one of the last big production film cameras and you could argue it's the first digital camera because it set the ray for the digital camera I used to use them a lot with students I used to use them myself for jobs like readings um, always found them moderately reliable I put the film through this yesterday and really enjoyed it so if you want a very practical film camera try the Canon EOS 300 I think it was called the Rebel in the States